Hello, everyone. I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners, and want to welcome you all. We certainly appreciate your attendance. Um, today's event, we're pleased to uh, have uh, VR resources on the town hall webinar. Um, VR um, trades on the, under the symbol VRR on the TSX Venture and VRRCF on the OTCQB. Um, most of the people on this call have been getting updates and um, uh, through our six minute CEO on VR resources, as well as we've done a fair amount of introductory work. But now this group is ready for the one hour call. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have Mike Dunning here, the CEO, president and director of uh, VR resources. Our host, Mike Gunning is uh, trained as a professional geologist with over 30 years of experience. Um, He's um, spans federal provincial um, geological surveys. He did exploration in North and South America with Cominco, now tech. Um, proven executive leadership in junior exploration, which is never an easy business. Um, and um, he's extensively published. He holds several industry awards and is a past president of numerous industry organizations. Um, Mike is currently focused on VR resources, 100%. Um, he's limited his board involvement to just one company, Aurelius Minerals, and has refrained from any advisory roles in the industry. So Mike is laser focused. Also with us today, we're pleased to have uh, the exploration manager for VR and chief geologist, Justin Daly. Justin, professional geologist, global experience, um, and he developed a real um, understanding of, of, uh, of in-depth knowledge of porphyry, epithermal, VMS mineral systems with his experience um, working um, in um, the Canada, in Mexico, Peru, Chile, um, exploring for copper and gold for tech, silver standard. He also worked for Centura and Predium. So those were all very successful companies. And during this time, um, he was the um, running the um, 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 the exploration program. So on that note, I'm going to turn the call to um, our host, Mike Gunning. Well, here we go. OK, can everyone see my screen and hear me? Are we good? Yes, we can. Look great, Mike. All good. Great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, David. Thank you, Evan, for attending. I am Mike Gunning, the CEO of VR. Uh, we're here for a pretty straightforward reason. We put out a news release a couple of weeks ago on our Amsoil Gold Silver project uh, down in Nevada. And the headline of this news was that we finally have our positive decision for our drill permit, which means that we can start to talk to drill companies about actually organizing a first pass drill program. But the underlying detail of that news, or at least the back half, if you will, we released some new geochronology data, some new age dates for AMSL. And they demonstrate that AMSL and Round Mountain are the same age. And in that, we provided other information about why we feel so strongly about this correlation to Round Mountain. And really, all we want you to take away from this webinar is the underlying color, if you will, as to this correlation between AMSL and Round Mountain. So for the bulk of this webinar, I'll let Justin run through the illustration of the bullet points that you can see in the news release. What I'm gonna do for five or six slides here is just introduce the very basic concept of why do we care about Round Mountain? Why is that relevant to AMSL? Many of you here will have heard about the Walker Lane belts in Nevada. Um, the map on the left is just an image that I don't want you to understand the details of. It's simply a look at the western margin of North America about 20 million years ago. And at that time, the tectonic plates, the Pacific and North America, they started sliding against each other as much as banging into each other. When you do that, you create extension. You form big cracks in the Earth's crust. Many of you will be aware of things like the San Andreas Fault in California. So that stippled area up in the top left of that diagram is just when you form this extension and you get these big granite batholiths coming in 
accommodated by these big structures. That's all the Walker Lane Belt is. It was a place 20 million years ago that you probably didn't want to be around. A lot of activity. What you're probably more aware of is the Walker Lane Mineral Belt. And what that relates to is the observation that in the Walker Lane Belt, big cracks, big intrusions of granites, but also as you can see on the right of this map on the right, these volcanic calderas, these rhyolite volcanoes. This extension allows the rhyolites to come up. What it also allows is for epithermal low sulfidation gold silver fluids to come up in association with these volcanic centers. And the two that we're going to talk about quickly are Comstock south of Reno up in the top left, and of course Round Mountain, which is just 40 kilometers to the north of our Big Ten project and AMSO. For those of you that have been to Nevada and you see the, the silver state as the logo on the license plates of every car in Nevada, it's because of this belt and it's because of these two deposits that we're going to talk about, Comstock and Round Mountain. Comstock, discovered in the mid 1800s, just an incredible story. Within 10 years, went into production and over 20 years produced almost 200 million ounces of silver. 8 million ounces of gold, essentially mined by hand. Uh, this is a photo that I took on a field trip. Obviously, this is pre-COVID when we actually got together on field trips. But you can see the endowment of these structures and of these rhyolite volcanics that all play into what we think is going on at Amsel. This is a view looking along Comstock, and it is really reinforcing the role of these big cracks in the earth, if you will. Comstock is more elongate as opposed to the more bulbous shape of Round Mountain and Amsel. It's almost five kilometers long. You can see it's a little bit younger than Amsel, about uh, 13 million years, but part of the same overall process, same host rocks, and most importantly what's the same is this yellow stained mineral called Agularia, and you're going to see a lot of that from Justin at Amsel. This is a low temperature alteration mineral of a potassium feldspar, and it has the ability to pack a lot of potassium into its crystal structure. And it is a fingerprint of Comstock and Round Mountain. These are gorgeous polished samples that they had on display during this field trip. On the left, you can see these hydrothermal breaches. That is a rock that is being shattered by boiling fluids. We know at Amsel, we're in this, this boiling level in the epithermal system. Justin's going to show you that. On the right, you see these beautiful banded quartz veins with open space. At Round Mountain, the gold is often filling the open space like you can see in the sample. And when you get the banding, it usually means a pulsing fluid. And that is a good way in the Walker Lane Belt to give you 200 million ounces of silver at Comstock or 20 million ounces of gold at Round Mountain. And again, these textures Justin is going to show you, but most importantly, beyond just the age, it is the tie of Agularia to Amsel that's important. Okay, that's Comstock. It was done by 1880. Round Mountain comes along in 1905, and it now has 120 years of continuous production under its belt. It has now surpassed 20 million ounces. You can see the VR truck here on the road in 2020. Amsel is essentially the next volcano, the next caldera to the south, about 40 kilometers away. And in this photo, you can see the sheer scale of Round Mountain, just in the size of the heap leach pads and the waste pads in, in the middle ground. The historic workings were in the covered hills in the background. And this is an important message from the webinar that Justin and I have learned, having worked with a consultant that used to be a barrack. Our view of Amsel today is of a large volume, low grade gold deposit, essentially because of what you see in this photo. But that's really about the transition of the historic workings on the higher grade veins to what we would call a modern mining operation. CRX in the mid 70s, Echo Bay, and eventually Barrick and Kinross, transitioning Round Mountain into a large scale heat leach. And that's important for Amsel because if you just look at this beautiful cross-section for which again, we don't need to understand the details. It's from a recent paper in SEG by Dave Reese. 
the scale of this open pit is about two by three kilometer. They're essentially now mining the entire low-grade potassium alteration envelope at Round Mountain. That's what Justin is going to show you at AMSOL, that type of footprint for potassium alteration linked back to Comstock with that yellow stain mineral called Agilaria. Look at the welded cap in this top figure, this idea of constraining the gold from escaping at Round Mountain. Justin's going to talk about that. But most importantly, look at the gold distribution in the bottom. Look at the number of areas where there is higher grade gold from one to five grams. The average production grade at Round Mountain today, I believe, is less than a gram. When it transitioned to open pit from underground, it was perhaps three or four grams. But what Round Mountain really is as a mineral deposit, not talking about the mining, is a collection of high grade veins. And that's what you can see in the lower section. And it's what you can see in this more simplified, more historic cross section from a 43101 back in 2000, showing really the same thing as you started to expand the Round Mountain pit into the modern heat bleach that it is. And you can see that they are essentially taking this entire potassium alteration footprint in the outline of the open pit. And you're carrying at least half a gram of gold in that. But it's these areas where you're containing the higher grade gold that are producing the bulk of those 20 million ounces at Round Mountain. And that's the message that I will leave you with. Like the photos of Comstock, like that very original map. The Walker Lane is large fundamental cracks in the Earth's crust forming 20 million years ago. Extensional networks of fractures, open space. They accommodate this rhyolit rhyolitic volcanics. They accommodate these low, uh, low sulfidation epithermal fluids. And the gold is precipitating in the cracks, as you can see in this photo, just a stock photo from Round Mountain with this beautiful electrum. And all of these attributes of these two deposits is what Justin is going to walk through in terms of what we see at AMSOL. And for you as investors, the message is to simply think about what is the upside of this drill program at AMSOL? This target has never been drilled before. Comstock was done by 1880. Round Mountain is approaching the end of its illustrious life. These are two of the most famous deposits in the world for epithermal gold silver. And the question is simply, where is the next Comstock? Where is the next Round Mountain? And the point of the next 20 minutes with Justin is to ask yourself as investors, what if AMSOL is the next Round Mountain? And I believe that there is an awful lot in our data in the second half of that news release that will address that question. So Scott, if we can hand over the screen to Justin, Chief Geologist and Exploration Manager at VR, he can walk you through all the exciting details from a straight geology point of view of why we're not taking this correlation lightly. Thanks, Mike. And uh, let's hope we see some of that beautiful electrum at the end of the drill bit in the upcoming drill program. So as Mike said, I'm gonna run through some of the geological considerations of why we think AMSOL is a epithermal quartz vein stockwork system comparable to Round Mountain. Mm -hmm. Uh, this isn't just neurology. We've thought long and hard about the, the correlations and similarities between the two. It is data driven. We're not just getting you excited about 20 million ounces in our, our neighbor. Um, it comes down to six uh, key correlations between the two of them that I'll run through. Uh, they appeared in the news release. The first is age, both being 26 million years old. Both of them occurred at the margin of their host caldera. Both of them are low sulfidation epithermal systems. They are both trapped by a welded tuff, as Mike mentioned. They both have a large agularia footprint, potassium alteration footprint, and they both have a strong correlation of gold and silver mineralization to pyrite. So zooming back out again uh, to uh, Mike's map here, this is a map of central Nevada, the central Nevada volcanic field. And each one of these red blobs is a caldera that formed between 35 and 22 million years ago. And as Mike said, this would not have been a very fun place to be at the time uh, with these large five to 30 kilometer across uh, calderas blowing up every couple hundred thousand years. Uh, it just wouldn't have been much fun. Up in the Northwest here at Round Mountain, 20 million ounces of gold in the Round Mountain caldera. 
26.5 million years old. The Manhattan caldera just south of it, 25 million years old. Amsel and Dambo are part of our Big Ten project within the Big Ten Peak caldera, 25.7 million years. And our Reveille property down in the southeast here on the margin of the Goblin Knobs caldera. And you may have noticed that each of these is along a northwesterly trend that becomes important for structural considerations. This is the edge of the Walker Lane. This is a big crack. You have to have a big crack to allow this amount of, uh, of magma and volcanic activity to get to surface. The other obvious correlation is the age date of all these host uh, calderas. They're all around 26 million years old. So with all that in mind, and after reading a, a few uh, papers um, linking the age dates of both Round Mountain and the Big Ten caldera, we decided to take a couple more samples for geochronology in 2019. We sent them for argon-argon dating at University of Oregon. We knew already that the tuff of Big Ten and the tuff of Round Mountain were deposited within a million years of each other. What we didn't know, though, was the, um, the scale of mineralization and how rapidly it happened at Amsel and how similar it is to that at Round Mountain. So 500,000 years between the formation of the caldera the volcano blew up through stuff all over the place, collapsed back in on itself, and that rhyolitic ash flow tuff filled in the caldera basin. Within a couple hundred thousand years, you have 20 million ounces of gold disseminated. Similar story at Amsel, 26 million years ago, caldera blows up, settles back in on itself, and mineralizing tuff site dikes, which we sampled, and all the alteration around it are within 200,000 years of that. So on a geological time scale, that is a blink of an eye. And really the, the million years that separates these two calderas is, is very insignificant. This is one of my favorite rocks, uh, the age date sample. This is a tuffosite dike at 25.57 million years. That is um, intimately correlated with the mineralized chalcedony veins here that host the gold and silver, these rusty spots are where the pyrite was located that has uh, oxidized away, leaving the gold and silver. And the host to the entire system is this clay altered tuff that has the Agularia sericite illite alteration in it, 200,000 years older. You can see how the fluids have fractured the rock and veins are coming out the sides. This is also where some of the gold and silver is hosted high up on the hill in the Amsel system. So why does this matter? Well, Amsel and Round Mountain um, are both gold and silver fluid systems. They are the same age in the same age called Deras, and they have the same rapid formation fingerprint. Remember, a couple hundred thousand years um, differentiating the start of eruption in the caldera with the end of crystallization of gold in quartz and chalcedony veins. So the second major correlation between the two is setting. Amsel is on the margin of the caldera, just like Round Mountain. You can see all of our properties in the Big Ten caldera are along this northwesterly trend that parallels that Walker Lane structural trend that Mike talked about um, between these two red dashed lines. And the caldera margin here is outlined in blue. This is a, a magnetic, regional USGS magnetic map. Everything southwest and west of the caldera margin would have been Paleozoic basement rocks. These are quartzites, siltstones, shales that uh, actually host Carlin style mineralization in northern Nevada on the Carlin and Battle Mountain uh, Carlin type trend. But here they are being blown apart by calderas. Uh, you can see that the caldera margin here on the southwest side is again sub parallel to the mineral trend within the caldera, and that has important structural implications. And we can see them here in this cross-section view. Um, on the left side of the figure here, on the west side, we have this mega breccia. When the caldera exploded, it ripped up house and apartment block sized um, blocks of, of quartzite and siltstone, and you can actually see them suspended in a volcanic ash flow tuff in the side of a hill. It's quite impressive to think about the scale of energy uh, required to blow something up like this. And further, to the east along a parallel structure, likely the, the basement architecture down here comes down and it is likely uh, trending on this same uh, normal fault here. This is where we took our age date. This is where we suspect um, there could be quite a bit of gold in uh, underneath the litho cap. 
And here, importantly, is what Mike talked about, that welded cap rock that is similar to Round Mountain as well. So to host the entire system, you need a soft and permeable and porous rock to host everything. And that's our unwelded ash flow lithic tuff that was age dated by the Nevada Bureau of Mines in 2013. This rock is easily fractured. It's easily brecciated. It's a good host rock for mineralization. And importantly, at both Ansel and Round Mountain, this type of rock is capped by a densely welded tuff with fiamme. So these shadowy areas here where Mike's purple pen is, these would have been pumice or pyroclastic fragments that flew through the air and landed and were quickly covered by more ash and, and other fragments and, and really squeezed down, making the rock impermeable to fluid flow. A little bit more brittle. This rock is what is trapping the fluid at both Round Mountain and Amsoil. So a little bit of fluid does get through where the rock is already broken, but overall this rock keeps a lid on the system. Things don't get through it. Further, uh, another correlation is the adularia or potassium alteration signature at Amsoil. It stands out within the Big Ten trend, a 20 kilometer long trend uh, containing gold veins at the Danbo property and the Clipper property. They are deeply eroded and exposed here. There's high grade gold and silver, 53 grams per ton gold and 58 grams per ton gold at the Clipper over here. But Amstel really does stand out uh, with the alteration assemblage at the top of the hill. And at VR, we do talk a lot about potassium alteration and we think it's important because it is very often correlated with mineralization in very powerful hydrothermal systems such as copper gold and copper molyporphyries, IOCGs, and epithermal systems like Round Mountain. And again, those are the age dates for some context. So the historic work uh, really got going in the mid to late 90s and early 1981 before the gold price crashed. Uh, historic workers who are pretty good at spotting adularia in the hills um, noticed that up here. They also saw some Calcedony veins, uh, they got to work with some trenches and some shallow drilling at the very top of the hill. But really the important part is that we have now realized with modern technology that this entire hill is a potassium alteration anomaly, even this wooded area that kept most of the historic workers out. And so they would have maybe used radiometrics to look for uranium in the 60s and 70s, but as we were working on Dambo further to south, the southeast off these maps, we decided to fly a magnetic and radiometric survey over the rest of the Big Ten caldera to get an idea of where we should be focusing our attention. Are there any other vein systems to be looking at? And one of the first things we noticed was this large, large radiometric potassium over thorium anomaly. Radiometrics, for those who don't know, really are just, you're seeing three different minerals, potassium, thorium, and uranium. Thorium and uranium are immobile, meaning they don't move around when you put a fluid through them. And so if you ratio the potassium that's coming along with the gold and silver fluids, you get an idea, you amplify that hydrothermal activity. And so we can see introduction of potassium fluids here at Amsel. This is a two by three kilometer uh, outline. And it is roughly the same footprint as the open pit at Round Mountain. Round Mountain being 1.5 by 2 kilometers, it is a giant hole in the ground. Uh, Hat Peak, we have also staked and investigated, but really uh, with the follow-up work that we've done, Amsel is where we want to spend our time and money. So as we zoom in on the Amsel property, again, you can see that north face of the hill, that's pretty much bald. There must have been a forest fire there several decades ago and the south face of the hill, which really hasn't seen much exploration in the modern era at all. It's relatively steep and uh, the access is tough. So we took a, a grid of soil and rock samples here and we found that there's gold just about everywhere, um, 30 to 250 ppb in some of these larger bulbs around the radiometric anomaly and focused within it. We also, in the rock geochemistry, noticed that almost every single sample was very elevated in potassium. And when you plot it on this cool ternary diagram from Scott Haley in Iogas, every sample within the radiometric anomaly plots in this adularia field here and our petro petrographic work really backs that up as well. Oh, and further, there's uh, some of the historic drilling here. A uh, good thing to note, there was 30 meters at 60 ppb gold. 
It's not enough, it's not economic, but in those shallow 79 and 122 meter holes, they're getting some pretty good sniffs. They just weren't in the exactly the right spot. So zeroing in on this Adularia story that Mike mentioned uh, at Comstock and Round Mountain, uh, this is a Adularia tuffocyte dike, and it is uh, cutting through the incredibly Adularia sericite and illite altered host rock up here. This is that court or crystallithic tuff. And the adularia is dispersed through here. This is a blue-gray calcedony vein with microsulfides disseminated in there. The sample was taken near the top of the hill uh, of, of Amsel, 10.8 grams per ton silver, 0.2 grams gold. So a little low grade, but that's what you expect to see uh, above the, the welded rocks at the top of the hill. So not a lot of fluid flow getting through there, just a little bit. As you move further down the hill, um, we get these quartz adularia vein breaches. And this is the real story of, of what's important with regards to pyrite. Every time you see sulfides at both Ansel and Round Mountain, you get gold and silver in varying degrees. But inevitably, if you sample something and see sulfides in it, you're going to get gold. And a little bit further along the trend, this is three kilometers away at our Dambo property, where things are a little bit more deeply eroded. Uh, we get 11.1 grams per ton gold and 11.6 grams per ton silver in this crustiform cockade style of boiling vein breccia. These purplish blue minerals here with the striations on them, they're called sulfa salts, and that's what's hosting our gold and silver. I'll show you why that's important a little bit later on. And so with all that pyrite and sulfide in mind, uh, this is what we want to look for to find some gold at Amsol. We decided to plan a 3D IP geophysics survey. So we put uh, five lines across the radiometric anomaly. And this is a, a 3D survey. So you lay out an entire grid of receivers, you pump electricity into the ground, and you see where there is metal located. So these red anomalies are where we have chargeability anomalies. This is where uh, geophysics indicate Sulfur, or sulfides below surface, and it correlates perfectly to where we see sulfur in soil. Those are these larger yellow dots, and they're spatially correlated with the chargeability anomalies, especially so in the Bellevue zone, North Bellevue here and South Bellevue here. These cool little uh, magenta pentagons are samples that indicate a high degree of adularia replacement in the rock, and those are concentrated here as well above those IP anomalies. And this is one of my favorite maps. It's a silver heat map. You can see again that northwesterly trend of the Walker Lane structure, uh, localization of silver in soil. The silver in soil was used to create this, this base map using regression and Kriging analysis. But really the prize is over here. The intensity of silver in soil, which obviously is associated with the gold that we're after, is concentrated above this large IP anomaly. And something interesting to note as well, there's, there's a gap between the two IP anomalies, and this is structurally controlled, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And fluids coming up those late faults uh, brought along some fluids that altered adularia into sericite. And we see that in the hyperspectral uh, sampling that we did. So again, I went through uh, the grid, we took samples, not based on mineralization, but based on alteration, trying to get an idea of what's happening in the system. And kind of by accident, we took a sample just north of our IP anomalies with 311 grams silver and 4.1 grams gold. This was a, a nice surprise. But going through the hyperspectral imaging, we can see quartz adularia veins in the long wave infrared uh, spectrum, we get adularia and quartz, microcline, adularia and microcline are both potassium feldspar minerals. And then the short wave infrared, we get information about the supergene clays over to printing them omerlinite and kaolinite. So that all leads us to the, the culmination of our data acquisition uh, before drilling, and, and that's uh, where do we drill? Obviously, we want to go after this large IP anomaly, but it's really understanding the how the system formed and why why it is the way that it is and the correlations with Round Mountain that really makes um, this IP anomaly important. The top of the hill is that welded tuff. That's that trap unit. So I've drawn a blue line here where we map it out uh, at surface. 
these blue wireframe blobs here, those are the high resistivity silica agillaria, agillaria alteration cap. So those are where the fluids came up on vertical cracks and they ponded below that lithologic boundary. And below those are these purple blobs where we have sulfide, sulfide equals gold. And you'll remember that there is some offset between the, the silver, sulfur, and gold uh, in soil and rock geochemistry from that chargeability anomaly that we show here. And that's because the fluids couldn't get all the way through the lithocap, they went sideways. And that's where we see them at surface today. And that's where we see our large multi-element gold, silver, arsenic, moly, tungsten, copper, just about any uh, vector element towards gold can be found on top of this big IP anomaly. So this is our target going into winter 2021, 2022. And like all good geologists, when we collect data in the field, we try and compare and contrast it with uh, well-known mineral deposit models. This is a model from Buchanan 1981, just about every single uh, exploration summary or slide deck from a company exploring an epithermal deposit will show you something like this. Uh, it's a good way of understanding why you have the minerals that you do and, and begin to tell yourself a story about what happened in the mineral system. You have your early Agillaria here. This is that flooding of Agillaria that we see at both Round Mountain and Amsel. You see your stock work of high-grade quartz veins within the alteration envelope. But I did something fun and I dropped the stratigraphy and structural geology from Amsel on top of this model to make some more sense out of it, we can see our tuffocyte dike, that's that crystal and ash mix trying to get to surface and blow at the top. It's getting stuck, it's getting overprinted by our mineralizing uh, gold and silver veins here. And you can see how they sort of form in these Y shapes. And that has a lot to do with when this volcanic caldera had blown up and fallen back in on itself and the magma chamber below it, it has depleted, so it begins to collapse again. And so you get these normal faults as everything collapses in on itself. And a little bit of extension, as Mike mentioned as well, in the Walker Lane. So you create space for these gold and silver fluids along with potassium to make it up to surface. They form these Y shapes as these antithetic or relay faults start to break off. And with all that in mind, the model is supported by all of our data from geochemistry, geophysics, hyperspectral imaging, you name it, it's all pointing in the same direction. This is a north-south uh, section through our IP model where you can see a resistive horse block, likely not with much uh, mineralization in it, but in the hanging wall of these normal faults, the north Bellevue uh, chargeability anomaly and the south Bellevue chargeability anomaly are where we're gonna find stock work veins with disseminated sulfide. And these are just my little doodles of what I think a quartz vein stock is gonna look like. So all we have yet to do is stick a drill on top of it on the flank of the hill and drill into these IP anomalies. We'll get hopefully some better grades than the historic work saw at the very, very top of the hill in that lift cap. These are the kind of rocks that we're after, quartz um, vein breaches, calcedony breaches. The host rock is completely altered to silica and agillaria. It's bleached white. And in these veins, you're gonna get uh, gold and silver and sulfides. I should note though, I led you into it. Um, at the very top of the system, you get lower grades, the gold is in pyrite. Deeper down in the system, you get gold and silver and sulfa salts like at Dambo. That's where you start to get 10 to 40 grams per ton gold. And that beautiful uh, crystalline electrum free gold sample from deep within Round Mountain, that's further down in these bonanza zones. So that's really the, the target of our drilling uh, this winter. And these are the permitted drill holes or drill pads um, that we've been waiting for. Uh, we've got 23 of them in all. We feel like this is a, a good amount to get us started on defining uh, the gold and silver in this system. And uh, it's never been drilled before. All the other drill holes are quite shallow. They were in between these chargeability anomalies. They saw anomalous gold. All we have to do is sit a drill right on top of this, drill through this anomaly and see what happens. And with that, uh, I wanna say thanks and we'll pass it back to Mike for some questions. Thanks, Justin. Great presentation. Uh, let's turn to questions now, Mike, unless you want to wish to add anything before I turn to questions. 
No, I'm I'm speechless after Justin. <laughs> Not at all. So happy to take any questions. Sounds good. Let's start with Dr. Woods in Atlanta. Dr. Wood, you'll have to unmute yourself. There we go. Yes. Yes, Dr. Gunning. Can Hello. you hear me? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I've been reading about your company for um, over a year now. Uh, I take the newsletter of uh, 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 McCoach. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah, my uh, and he's you know very you're in the top ten of his list, but I've been hearing sort of this story from him, and then also from reading your website uh, for a long time, and uh, I'm just wondering what has been the delay in actually getting some drilling. Now you have really analyzed, seems like every bit of sand in uh, Nevada, you know, on your property, but uh, was there a, a delay in uh, like permitting or uh, funding or what? Has, has Dr. Taken so Wood. Long? Dr. Wood, you didn't yeah. want our six minute CEOs we sent you, did you? Or did you? Uh, uh, good question. I can answer that question in four words. It's the U.S. Forest Service. Um, Nevada has mixed land use. Most of our properties are administered by BLM. Uh, the U.S. Forest mm -hmm. Service administers um, the Big Ten Caldera. And the difference in permitting, Dr. Wood, is that on the BLM, you can do a notice of intent before you do a full um, plan of operations. And that allows you to do reconnaissance drilling normally within a permit period of, of less than 30 days. The Forest Service has you go to a plan of operations right away and they simply take longer and so the reason for the delay is simply to allow the forest service to move through the process of the plan of operations permit for which we have to do some ground studies and has to get vetted by a number of parties um, as i've said to most of our shareholders the forest service has never had an issue with our permit application it's just simply a more involved process than it is with the BLM. Great. Thanks, Mike, for answering. Let's turn to uh, Nino, Nino Scalamandre. Good to have you on the call, Nino. He's just unmuting. Take a second. Just a reminder, you can unmute yourself by using the uh, microphone icon on your control panel. We have Ron Shore unmuted. Let's start with Ron, then we'll go to Nino. All right, I apologize. I was a little late in the call. Hope you haven't answered these questions. Is there anything refractory at all about a lot of the sulfide that you have? I guess the short answer is we, I would say we don't know until we get a first pass drill program done and get a better representation of the sulfide. I think what you see at surface is pyrite, and as Justin showed, there are these sulfur salts that are probably carrying uh, silver and gold in their lattice. So really the, the best answer is, let us get a drill program done and get a better spectrum of sulfide to really answer that. But if you look at Round Mountain and Comstock, uh, you know, the gold is basically free in the open space in these fractures. There is an association with pyrite, but the association is not at the crystal lattice scale. Is uh, what kind of depths do you intend to drill to, and do you have any indications? Uh, you know, Nevada seems to be uh, a state that's been fairly well explored near the surface, and most of the new deposits will come from depth. Uh, what's your feelings there? I think in short, the drill holes will be three to 500 meters. As Justin has showed, these drills are gonna be essentially collared in the gold bearing um, alteration cap with potassium. So in the Buchanan model, you should be moving into the boiling zone where you're getting higher grade gold quickly. 
So you shouldn't have to drill more than three or 400 meters. Uh, AMSL had cursory exploration in 1980 and the price of gold collapsed. Big oil moved out of minerals, period. Selco disappeared. The reason that AMSL has, has not been drilled to your question is simply, it was, I believe this company in 1980 was actually on the right track. They were understanding what was happening at Round Mountain in terms of this transition from artisanal veins to a large gold system. But the steam ran out of the engine at Amsel and our business changed. That company disappeared. Uh, by Nevada standards, this project is considered remote. I see a truck in Justin's photo. So for me, coming from BC, uh, this is a cakewalk, um, but there's many reasons why Amsel was essentially left alone for the last 40 years. Final question: uh, Does um, are there many uh, mills with uh, spare capacity that you would be able to use uh, fairly nearby your properties, two properties? Well, probably the first answer to that, well, first of all, we need we need to find this before we really address that. But I think if you look at this area of Nevada, because the gold is occurring as electrum, the reason the Round Mountain is the biggest heat leach in the world is that it responds well to that essentially on-site processing. And they did the same thing at Paradise Peak. So I think that would actually be your default for something like Amsel, would be that you have a a gold and silver mineralization that responds to that very straightforward uh, heat leach process, which you would do independently. Okay, thanks and good luck. Thank you. We got Nino. Nino, are you unmuted? Not yet. Let's go to Murray, Murray Vanderbilt. Murray, good to have you on the call. We're about to unmute you. There you are. Um. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I did not look at your six-minute uh, presentation, and I can't remember what the previous presentation was six months ago. But I see you've got what three and a half million dollars, and I'm just, can you, how far much drilling can you do? How far does that take you? And give us some timeline on uh, sure. uh, when we might expect to see some results. A uh, company's got 80 million shares out. The treasury right now at the end of the year is a little bit more than 2 million. The treasury will carry us through the first pass drilling of Amsel and the GNA to operate this company right through 2022. So the treasury is good. In terms of timeline, I think Justin and I would like to try and get a first pass drill program done this winter. And compared to 2019 and 2020, Geochem Labs have improved their response time for assays. So the best case scenario is that we get a, a short first pass drill program done in the next two or three months. And we have data from that released early this spring. And uh, can you, will you be down 600 meters or how, how far down are you going? And honestly, I really don't think we need to. Um, I think in so many of Justin's figures, <laughs> The, the drill is basically going to be collared in a potassium alteration cap with gold and silver mineralization at surface. The pyrite uh, IP anomalies that are mapping pyrite basically come to surface. So in the good old Buchanan model, within two or 300 vertical meters, you should be through your strongest gold and silver zones. And this is not a conceptual target where you are asking yourself what is underneath the cover what is underneath the drill what is underneath the sandstone the the drill is basically sitting in outcrop in our target with gold and silver we're simply trying to get in that very specific point in the buchanan model that justin is pointing to where you're actually getting boiling and your gold grades go from you know less than a gram to bonanza grades. And Amsel, with everything we've done over three or four years, I should be happening within the first two or three hundred meters. Thank you yeah, very it's much. Also worth remembering too the vertical scale at Amsel. We tend to focus at the top of the hill. Everybody likes to go to the top of the hill and have a look around, but the there is high grade gold over a gram 
along the side of the hill and the valley floor is roughly 300 meters below the top of the hill here. So it depends on what we find and how we find it um, or if, but the, the main point is that um, it won't be far below surface considering um, that most of the, the IP anomaly is actually on the flanks of the hill and there's good access from the, the side further down in the valley bottom. So it depends on the structure and everything like that. But uh, even if we do drill a deep hole, it's, it's actually not all that far from the surface nearby. Or in can, other you words, the, can you throw the integrated section on IP, Justin? The slide at the end? Yep. Oh, back, back. This one? Previous. Oh, that one, yeah. yeah. So what Justin is saying is, if you're at the top of the hill, you're very close to the the, the welded cap. You're in the you're in the litho cap with gold. Probably within 50 meters, you should be getting into a greater concentration of pyrite as the fluids are heating. But if you go down to the bottom of the hill on the left, down in the valley, you're essentially starting 200 meters down. Yeah, and I in see. That area, you literally should be starting in the core of your target. I see it. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. And the, the drill pads are situated where they are because uh, to expedite our long permitting process, we put drill pads on these roads just to make the permitting process easier. As you progress this project, if there is a discovery, then you just start putting drill pads everywhere and defining things using this road down here as well. Okay, let's turn to Marshall Barrow. Marshall? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I do have a few questions. Uh, you mentioned you have about, as I understand, about two million in cash, and that'll carry you through this uh, AMSL drilling your your GNA. But um, you you also have some other properties uh, in in Ontario. Uh, you planning any work on those? Yes, is the short answer to that. I think. Hecla Kilmer has shown itself to be what I think can be an important uh, critical metal discovery in Canada for North America. We're also not finished with the copper and gold there yet. So we are already looking at funding strategies and drilling strategies for this winter. Do the funding strategies likely to be a, a, a financing, uh, a public uh, uh, financing or you're looking for strategic partners? Well, even if it's strategic partners, it still goes through a generic public financing. So it's really just a matter of who wants to participate and whether uh, an institution who is mining long or a mining company sticks up their hand as a strategic placement specifically for a project like Hecla Kilmer or for Amsel for that matter. Um, regardless, that's all those strategies are already in the mix master so to speak uh, for this winter at Hecla Kilmer for sure okay and then in Nevada I know there's areas in Nevada where it's not really feasible to drill through the winter uh, I take it uh, where you are it, you can drill through the winter I think for reconnaissance exploration um, where I think you know before you've got a discovery on your hands you want to be watching your pennies and being efficient. And in this area with AMSL, I think November, December, January, February, you're probably okay for drilling. It's more likely to be cold and dry. The bigger snow accumulations in this range and in other ranges we have worked in, ironically, are often in the spring. It gets a little warmer, it gets moister. It might be raining in the valleys, but it's probably snowing up top. So I think at a place like AMSL at a reconnaissance stage, uh, you'd look at the next three or four months as your window. And I would suggest through the spring, I think you're fighting it too hard. And we would let uh, a period wait until the, the late spring. If you make a discovery, I think you then have the inertia that AMSO, like most areas in Nevada, you can work 24, sorry, 12 months a year. But I think for our reconnaissance work, I would look at the window for the next three to four months. Okay, and then, uh, I, I think you touched on this, but uh, to, just to review it, you you uh, you've got the permit to do the drilling, 
and you're going to start that what in the next within the next 30 days you anticipate, and then uh, what 30 days for drilling and another 30 to 60 days for the assay results to come back. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank. You. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Um. So let's okay. turn to yeah, Martin DeBovis. Martin, question today. Okay, Martin, we can come back to you if you unmute. Let's go to Heinz Toma. Heinz. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Can you tell me who the major shareholders are at the moment? We have six mining long institutions and myself who own about 50% of our 80 million shares. RCF in US Global in the US, Gold 2000 and Plether in Europe and Probity and Alpha here in Canada. I'm still the largest shareholder. Super, that says a lot, thanks. It does. I am extremely grateful for these mining long institutions who have stuck their neck out for early stage exploration and they don't all do that. They're not just investing in the sector, they're investing in this company and our track record and our assets. Many of them have been with me since I was private and uh, I'm very grateful for the support we get from them. And you can believe that they know exactly what the upside potential is on projects like Amsel and Hecla Kilmer. I don't have to explain to them what the potential here is on this drill program. Thank you. Thank you, Heinz. We'll turn to Chesley Morton. Chesley, if you have a question, Chess. Yes, I do. If you can hear me, we can. We can. Um, Wonderful graphics, and I've seen a few of these, so I'm just trying to grapple with the basics, if you'll be so kind to entertain me on that level. Um, it appears that you have to have a series of happy events, a volcanic uh, event that lays down the host rock, subsequent event that shatters that host rock uh, to some degree, allowing for another event that deposits um, mineral rich fluids which then settle out and make deposits and I always see this and I'm wondering at some point is a volcanic event inherently rich in gold to where that always happens is there a level near the mantle that just is widely disseminated gold that gets concentrated in these fluids how does this come about or did you just get lucky and there was a feeder zone at great depth and the fluids just happen to pass through it? That's a I'll good question. You, I'll give you a geology answer and then a, a mining industry answer. That should be on the cover of a textbook, a series of happy accidents on yeah. the horse review. Yeah. Well, I learned at Kamenko 30 years ago, when we think about great ore bodies, great mineral deposits, we tend to think of a single Superman component of that deposit. But what we talked about a lot at Kaminko is that what all great mineral deposits have in common is that everything worked. And so all the pieces of the puzzle that you are talking about, they all clicked. And one of the things I try and mentor in young explorationists and investors for that matter, is to sometimes not focus on the Superman aspect, but to focus on what we call the fatal flaw because it only takes one of those components to not be working to preclude yourself from getting a round mountain or a comstock everything has to click to get a deposit like round mountain uh so that's my um uh, my aside to answer your question from a geology point of view these extensional terrains with these rhyolite volcanic centers they tend to be volatile rich. They have lots of CO2. And as these chambers are evolving, the CO2 is evolving off of the magmas. And what happens is the metals get carried along with that CO2. So in fact, these types of settings, these types of vol volcanic centers 
they are good places to look for gold and silver. But the most interesting answer to your question is a session that I arranged a roundup, the Big Cordilleran Conference here in Vancouver about 10 years ago. And we are in the grind of our cycle after the capital crisis. And I organized a session called, what does the industry need to do to survive when capital is tricky? And one of the things we need to do is to triage all of the peripheral exploration and to only focus on exploration that matters, where the prize is worth it. And that's why I put in the slide of the Electrum on my seventh slide. Amsel is an example of the potential prize is worth it. One of the speakers we had at that session was no less than Jay Hodgson, uh, a seminal worker in, in the world in origin and gold deposits from Queen's University, ultimately the chief geoscientist at Barrick the world's largest coal company. So here's a guy that could go to the microphone and spew on for six hours above the heads of every single person in the audience, every vice president, every chief geologist. Jay is the man. And you know what he said in that talk? He said, if you want to find a big gold deposit, I suggest you go to a place in the Earth's crust where there's gold. And he actually pointed to Nevada, and he pointed to the Archean in Ontario and in Australia. And so, as geologists, well, first of all, when Jay Hodgson speaks, you listen. And that is a lesson that you need to take that when we put our mineral deposit models together, we tend to think that everything is equal. But unfortunately, that's not true. And I think Jay is right that there is something about the Earth's crust in Nevada in that time frame from 10 to 50 million years ago, where there was a fertility of gold and silver, and then everything else worked. But before you had all those other things working, you were in the right place on this planet for gold fertility. And made a big impression on me when a person like Jay, who was a consultant at the time, could baffle people with complexity, boiled it down to something as fundamental as that. Go to a place in the Earth's crust where there's gold and you'll find gold. And that's why we started this talk with the Walker Lane Belt. That's super. Um, you know, they've been mining up near Yellowstone because that's kind of a um, <laughs> hot spot, but there's a series of presentations of that same hotspot over the map um, going westward. I guess the crust has been moving in the opposite direction. So are each one of those being explored because they all produced uh, mineralization? I know Justin wants to answer this, but I'm going to. Okay, that's not just a hotspot. That is the hotspot. That, okay. is, that is a mantle plume of which North America is drifting over. That is uh, where you are really tapping into the bowels of the earth. That's not quite the same thing as what Justin is showing here with his map on the left, mm -hmm. where you're taking the margin, the, the Western margin of North America, forming these big uh, extensional faults and cracks and allowing these rhyolite magmas and intrusions to come up. <laughs> What you're talking about at Yellowstone is almost another order of magnitude and don't get in the way of a mantle hotspot. Yeah. Yeah, they found that out in Hawaii. Um, your area yeah. looks more like, uh, because it's linear, looks like more of a uh, creation of a subduction zone or something. It is, it actually happened when the subduction stopped. The Pacific plate started moving to the north essentially sideways to North America. And when the subduction stopped, the cracks opened. And if you wanna find a gold deposit of surface, you need to get those cracks open and you need to get the fluids moving up. And the way you do that, stop the subduction and start transpression. Form the, form the San Andreas Fault and start moving things around. You have a great presentation. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Chesley. Um, Bruce Daigle. Bruce, we've got you. Uh, Bruce is on the phone. Could you unmute? Hey, there. How are you, Bruce? Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much. I was on the phone for more than half of it, so I really don't have anything to say. I want to re, re, re look at everything on the replay, but I'm very excited about these updates. Keep them going, please, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, do we have questions from the audience, um, Scott? Yes, we do. Um, one that I wanted to bring up right away, because it was really a follow-up question to something you already answered about the drilling this winter at AMSL. Uh, could you just clarify how many holes and would they be diamond drill or RC rig? Uh, I would say four to six holes is, would be a good first pass. And RC versus RC is going to depend on what's available, depend on what we feel is the most cost efficient. Either of them are going to give you gold in geochemistry if we can get ourselves into a quartz stock work. Uh, I care how we spend our money, and it's going to boil down to who's available. We've been talking to drill companies about this program since the summer. So you're just going to have to stay tuned on the answer to that one. Okay, thank you. Another question about AMSL. The open pit at Round Mountain is uh, 2,500 meters by 1,500 meters, which is fairly close to the VR outline of the potassium alteration footprint at AMSL. Do you, Mike, Justin, think AMSL will ultimately be open pit or underground operation? <laughs> We're not allowed to answer that question. That's too forward. Too forward looking. Okay. Too much of a forward looking statement. <laughs> I think the point that I tried to make early was in part just to convey a really interesting learning curve that Justin and I had, which is the transition of Round Mountain uh, from underground vein mining to this large-scale open pit operation. And like virtually every, not every, but many mineral deposits and mines through their life, you start early with a focused mining on high grade. Once your capex is paid off and your infrastructure is established, it's much more easy and cost-effective to essentially keep the mining going by expanding the footprint of the mine and you're able to take lower grade material because your capex is paid off mm -hmm. and really the transition of round mountain has done that over 120 years in you know in 1905 you don't start by mining the large grade potassium alteration footprint so i think at amsel it's simply important to realize that maybe it's not just a coincidence that the potassium alteration footprint at AMSL is more or less the same size as the alteration footprint around Mountain, which now is encompassed by this very large open pit operation. And so it simply gives you a view of scale of what volume of rock potentially is mineralized at AMSL, which I think you can already see in a number of the slides in Justin's presentation. Um, how it's mined, uh, we got to get some drill holes done first. All right, great, thank you. The next two questions I have are actually about Hecla Kilmer, if you don't mind. Um, the first one is the November 16th, 2021 press release reports REE assays at HK for drill holes two and four. Dr. Gunning, if you can, the IOG model is still applicable to HK as there was no report of copper or gold. Does, do you observe, does he observed Pathfinder elements? Did you observe Pathfinder elements? I think I'd like, uh, without being coy, I'd like to see all the data from the next five holes as with Justin um, to really understand what's going on at uh, Hecla Kilmer. I would say the most accurate description that we have so far is that it is a hydrothermal breccia fluid system, which has an evolved IOCG chemical affinity, especially with the light rarers, that is hosted in carbonatite. And carbonatite is strongly influencing where Hecla Kilmer sits on what is ultimately a very broad spectrum in the IOCG model with copper and gold at places like Olympic Dam and Carapatina, and iron and light rare earths at places like Karun in Sweden. Hecla Kilmer is sitting somewhere in that spectrum. We have seen copper and gold grains in historic core rubble. 
we have seen calcopyrite veins with hematite in all two. Uh, we can see elevated hydrothermal gold in our uh, cyanide porphyry dikes. But at least in hole five, we see uh, almost a 300 meter intersection with half a percent of, of light rare earths. And so at least early, what is obvious in this chemical affinity is the light rare earths. So I don't mean to avoid the question, it's a great question. And it's something that we will be looking at for the next three or four months. What I would encourage people to do is remember that these IOCG systems are spectrums of mineral deposits, of which there are many. And in the case of Hecla Kilmer, the most important thing to know is that you are in a carbonatite, and that's going to influence. And so the drilling that we have to do going forward is twofold to delineate the mineralization that we've found, given its scale, and also to continue to flesh out this question what about the copper and the gold? We've seen it in the core rubble. We've seen it in our own drill hole. Um, are there other places in Hecla Kilmer where the chemistry of the fluid changes and the bias of the mineralization changes? And Hecla Kilmer is a big complex and we're only just getting going. So that's part two of what we need to do with our drilling is continue to flesh out that possibility of your question in the IOCG model. C and G stands for copper and gold. And it's just going to take a while. Understood. Thank you. Uh, really, the final question is about Hecla Kilmer as well. And it it is um, a question you kind of have answered, um, but the last part of it I wanted to make sure got heard. The In terms of Hecla Kilmer and the total cost of doing uh, remote work there and the promise that you have at AMSOL, what, how do you balance the priority between Ontario and Nevada? I think um, to put AMSOL on the same keel as Hecla Kilmer, you need to get the first pass drill program done. Our goal in 2020 was to do our first pass drill programs at Reveille, AMSOL, and Hecla Kilmer to ask yourself the question, what's the potential here? What, is, what are these integrated targets showing us in terms of mineralization? Reveille and Hecla Kilmer are done uh, in terms of first pass, or at least starting of the first pass. And Amsel, we hope to get done in the first three or four months. So I suppose the first answer to the question would be, let us get Amsel done. And then they really are on the same footing. Beyond that though, I think they are both showing the promise of what I would call scale of footprint, um, location advantages in terms of infrastructure and logistics, mineralization at surface, that if we can show the kind of in indication of mineralization in AMSL that we can see at Hecla Kilmer, starting at surface and moving for 300 meters, they are going to be prioritized the same way as what I think could potentially be important discoveries, not just for the company, but for the mining industry. In the case of critical metals for North America and potentially copper and gold at Hecla Kilmer, and obviously gold and silver for the gold and silver industry in Nevada uh, for Amsel. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are the questions from the audience. If we get any uh, additional questions, we'll send them to you guys for you to answer. Thank you. And I wanted to circle back to Mike Ward. Mike, um, if you're there, do we miss anything in your viewpoint um, that you'd like to cover? No, I don't think so. I would just like to thank everyone for taking time to take in this webinar. For my shareholders that are on this call, I would like to thank you for your patience, for letting us get this drill permit. Um, this target had our attention two years ago. There is nothing new in Justin's talk. Uh, we have been waiting for this for a while, so I'd like to thank our shareholders. I would remind our shareholders that this target has got every bit of the upside that it had two years ago. So we don't want to let the drill permit process take away from why we got excited about AMSOL two years ago. Um, and we'll also just thank Justin for his time on this webinar and the walk through the data. Um, I thank can't do all the graphics. I can't do all the graphics that Justin does. Thank you, Justin. Michael, I wanna thank everyone for your participation today and I wanna wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.